Good evening. Welcome to the evening service of Ferntree Gully Independent Baptist Church. I trust that you had a great afternoon. You're able to spend some time with your family, some time to relax, some time to have some fun with each other. But more importantly, I hope that God spoke to you and that you were challenged by this morning's message on personal revival. We know that the Lord Jesus Christ could come back for his church at any moment, and therefore we must be ready. And that's why we desperately need our hearts and minds to be devoted to the Lord. We need to be praying that God would rekindle in, our, in us a desire to seek him with all of our hearts and minds, and that uh, we would have the spiritual vitality, that we would have the, the just the uh, the changed desires that that would cause us to seek the Lord uh, as a priority in our life, that we would seek to be devoted to Him uh, in all things. Well, we are currently physically separated from each other, and therefore it's important to grasp the need to be praying for one another. Indeed, Scripture admonishes us to do exactly that. For instance, in James chapter 5 and verse 16, the scripture tells us to pray for one another. Pray one for another. And I trust that we are doing that. Ephesians 6.18 says, Praying always with all prayer. That means all kinds of prayer and supplication in the Spirit and watching thereunto with all perseverance. And notice this part. And supplication for all saints. That means bringing requests for of the saints before the Lord, praying for other believers. In Romans 12.12, 12, rejoicing in hope, patient in tribulation, continuing instant, which means being steadfast or faithful in prayer. And I trust that we're doing that, or that we're desiring to do that. Prayer is an act of obedience, and God calls us to pray, and therefore we must respond. In fact, we would not be going too far to say that prayer is absolutely necessary for ourselves and for others. I hope that we are growing in appreciation of just how much we need prayer and therefore just how much others need our prayers for them. Well, tonight's message is about prayer. In fact, it's entitled Powerful Prayer. And we're going to be turning to the book of Psalm and uh, Psalm chapter 66, but the preacher is Alton Beale. Alton Beale is an evangelist, but he's also the president of Ambassador Baptist College. And this is the same Bible college that James Hood attended. And some of us might remember Brother Hood, and we uh, really appreciated his ministry in our church over the years. Uh, of course, he's back in the States and ministering periodically uh, in evangelism in the West Indies, and so we can still be praying for him. But I trust that this message by Dr. Alton Beale uh, will challenge us and we will rekindle the passion for prayer in our lives and remind us of the need to be praying. Yes, for our own needs, but also for the needs of others, uh, of our brothers and sisters. But even as First Timothy chapter 2 says, praying for our the lost world as well. Well, before we get to the message, we will pray and then sing a couple of hymns. Let's pray. Our gracious, loving Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, for the great grace and mercy that, Lord, you've poured out upon us, Lord, and given us, Father, uh, Lord, um, new life in Jesus Christ, a, a union with him, and Lord, we can say, as the scriptures say, that Christ lives in us. And Lord, we pray that we would be always drawing from his power and seeking to fellowship and Lord, to walk with Christ and to be obedient to him and to love him through our obedience. And Lord, we just pray that you would speak to us tonight about the need of prayer, about Lord, um, not being complacent, not being, uh, Lord, lethargic when it comes to spiritual things, but, Lord, given the the time and, Lord, how quickly and how um, or, or how soon we, that Christ could come back, Lord, that we would not be caught napping, Father, but that we would be diligent and fervent 
in our prayer life, that we would exhibit powerful prayer, just like Elijah, Lord, um, exhibited, Lord, on Mount Carmel, and that, Lord God, we would see great and mighty answers to our prayer and great glory going to Thee. Speak to us, Lord God, remind us of the necessity of prayer and just how much, Lord, we depend upon You and therefore how much we need to be praying. And Father, help us all, Lord God, to um, seek that, that uh, spiritual awakening, Lord, that you will promise to those who personally seek you with all of their hearts. And we pray these things in Jesus' holy and precious name. Amen. Well, we're going to sing the hymns, I Need Thee Every Hour, and then I Must Tell Jesus, and then we'll go straight into the message.
God calls moms and dads as well. And uh, so it's never too early, you're never too late to surrender to God and to let Him have His way. But it's a joy uh, to be with you tonight, and I want to invite you to take your Bibles and turn with me to Psalm 66 tonight. Psalm 66 this evening. The book of Psalms, admittedly, is probably my most favorite book of the Bible. Now, typically, when you ask me that question, and you say, what's your most favorite book of the Bible, that usually is whatever book I'm reading at the time because you get so engrossed in it. But tonight, uh, I'd like to invite you to join me in Psalm 66 this evening. And uh, one of my most favorite books of the Bible is the book of Psalms, because it gives us an entrance uh, into the heart of David. Uh, when I read the book of Psalms, I feel like here's a man who's a human being just like I am. There's sometimes David, his soul is cast down. Has your soul ever been cast down? You say, ah, oh, my soul's never been cast down. Well, it's good to have you visiting from heaven tonight. I'm glad you're with us. You know, there are times where David prayed, Lord, kill them. Remember those imprecatory prayers? There are times that David just took the time to praise the Lord. I believe that God looked down on David in those psalms of praise. And he said, David, I like that music so much, I'm going to put it in a hymnal for the whole world to read. And that's how we get the book of Psalms. But tonight in Psalm 66, I want to begin reading in verse number 17. The psalmist writes, I cried unto him with my mouth, and he was extolled with my tongue. If I regard iniquity, the Lord will not hear me, but verily God hath heard me. He hath attended to the voice of my prayer. Blessed be God, which hath not turned away his prayer, or my prayer, and his, nor his mercy from me. And tonight I want to bring to you a message that I have entitled, Powerful Prayer. I believe in verses 17 through 20 tonight, we see three great elements to giving us powerful prayer. One of the things that I enjoy doing is I enjoy reading. I enjoy reading about history, Christian history, uh, American history. I enjoy reading biographies. Some of you young people in here tonight, you need to put down a PlayStation controller long enough to learn to love to read. Uh, I'm not against having fun, but I'm afraid we've got a younger generation that's got strong thumbs and weak minds. And uh, I would encourage you this evening, uh, boy, learn to love to read. It will take you a long ways. And one of the subjects that I enjoy reading about is the subject of revival. And just as an aside tonight, ladies and gentlemen, I believe that God can still send us revival. But in reading on the subject of revival... I noticed that there was something that preceded a specific revival, a revival that took place in Wales in the early 1900s. Some ladies would gather together for some spontaneous prayer meetings, and they would pray together that God would send revival to that place. And sometimes all they could pray because of a burdened heart was simply three words, Lord, bend us. That was their cry over and over and over again. And in time, God shook that place called Wales unlike anything it ever seen before. People were saved left and right, Christians getting right with God. And an amazing revival took place in, the, uh, took place in Wales. But ladies and gentlemen, I believe that if we're going to see a revival in this country, we're not going to see much happen until it is preceded by powerful prayer. But folks, let me tell you what we're guilty of tonight when it comes to prayer. We have treated prayer as a convenience instead of a priority. We pray when we feel like it. We pray when we think we have time and our schedules. And we don't pray because it's of something of the very essence of our soul that we need greatly. We don't pray because it's just like the very air that we breathe. We give God the leftover of our, leftovers of our day, and that's how we, how we approach prayer. Folks, another thing that I'm afraid that we're very guilty of tonight is that prayer has become a ritual instead of a pleasure for some of us. Now, sometimes we knock other denominations because they have prayer books and because they have rituals that they perform. But can I tell you, I believe that in independent Baptist circles, we've got a form of ritualism ourselves. We know exactly what to pray, when to pray, how to say it. Somebody calls on us to pray, and we automatically begin thinking about everybody else who's hearing the prayer rather than the God that we're offering the prayer to. And we treat prayer as such a ritual. We pray in the morning. We pray before our meals. You say, preacher, is that wrong? No, but there has to be heart in it. 
And another thing that we're guilty of when it comes to prayer is that we have, create, we have treated prayer as a burden instead of a blessing. When we hear of a prayer meeting for revival or we hear of a midweek prayer service among some people, there's a great sigh. And you know what that attitude has led to? You take a group of people that have a weak attitude towards prayer and a prayer meeting, and I'll guarantee you it won't be very long before a midweek service disappears. It won't be very long until that group of people let Sunday night services be negotiable, and before you know it, all they're doing is having a glorified Sunday school on Sunday morning. But folks, I'm here to tell you tonight, I believe that we need powerful prayer like that which was evidenced in the life of Elijah. Boy, there are a lot of scenes that I would have loved Pastor to have seen in the Bible firsthand. And one of those would have been Elijah in, on the, in the prophets of Baal on Mount Carmel. I've had the privilege of being at Mount Carmel twice. And in both times, I've imagined what would it have been like to see the man of God standing against many, many prophets of Baal. The basic showdown and during that passage of Scripture was that they were going to see whose God was really God. Is it Jehovah or is it Baal? And you have one man against many. And the prophets of Baal go first as they call for their false god to do something. There were, an altar had been constructed. The idea was for, to call down fire to rain upon that altar and to consume it. And so the prophets of Baal, they cried, they screamed, they begged. And as to be expected, absolutely nothing happened. And then Elijah does something that I laugh and snicker at. While those boys are getting upset and jumping up and down, cutting themselves, beating themselves, trying to get the attention of their false god, we find Elijah, so to speak, it's as if he leaned up against a sycamore tree and he said something very sarcastic. He said, maybe your God's on a journey. That's 2014 vernacular. He was saying, your God's on vacation. And then he says to those prophets of Baal, he said, maybe your God's asleep. And Elijah, full well knowing that his God, not only did he not sleep, but he didn't even slumber or begin to fall asleep. And finally, after the prophet of God had enough of that foolishness, he said, all right, fellas, it's our turn. And Elijah did something very peculiar. Before he even uttered his first word of prayer to God, he had that altar wetted repeatedly. As we would say in North Carolina, it was sopping wet by the time they were finished. You know why Elijah did that? I'll tell you why Elijah did that. Elijah wanted them to understand that what was about to take place was not a David Copperfield illusion, and neither was it anything up the sleeve of man. He wanted them to know that if that fire came from anywhere, it was going to come from God, and it was going to consume that wet altar. And then before the miracle took place, you know, if you've read that passage, you know what happened. The Bible says that Elijah prayed. Now, folks, I'm here to tell you tonight, that's powerful prayer. Now, you may think me crazy tonight, you may think me foolish, and you're welcome to do so for the next 30 minutes, but I want to tell you, I believe tonight that every Christian in this room can have powerful prayer just like Elijah. I believe tonight when the burdens roll into your life and when the impossibilities come that you can cry into the same God and you can see great miracles, but you have to have powerful prayer. And I want you to see three very simple things tonight. Number one, I want you to see tonight the cry of prayer in verse number 17. Notice in verse 17 again, he says, I cried unto him with my mouth. Now, I want to stop for just a moment and ask you this. When is the last time you called unto God? That word cry, it doesn't always have the literal meaning of weeping. Sometimes it's the idea of calling. You know, in my life personally, there have been times where my hopes have been dashed and my heart has been broken and I've literally wept to God. There have been other times I've sat in a service just like you and I've been called upon to pray. And I stand and I just call upon the Lord. And you know what? There have been times, folks, where there have been no more tears and no more wind to be expended for voice to come out of my voice box. And without even saying a word, I could call unto God. 
But when's the last time that you've really spent time calling out to God, the cry of prayer? We're not going to have powerful prayer if we don't have the cry of prayer. He said, I cried unto him with my mouth. I believe that that cry was indicative of three things. Number one, it was indicative of a sign of desire. The psalmist desired God. The psalmist said in Psalm 73 and verse 25, Whom have I in heaven but thee? But there is none upon earth that I desire beside thee. Psalm 63 and verse 1, the Bible says, O God, thou art my God. Early will I seek thee. My soul thirsteth for thee. My flesh longeth for thee in a dry and thirsty land. Psalm 84 and verse 1, the Bible says, How amiable or how lovely are thy tabernacles, O Lord of hosts. My soul longeth, yea, even fainteth for the courts of the Lord. My heart and my flesh crieth out for the living God. Psalm 42 and verse 1, As the heart panteth after the water brook, so panteth my soul after thee, O God. All of those verses have one thing in common, a strong sense of desire. Folks, it's my contention tonight that if we cry unto God, it's because we desire Him. The flip side of that coin, if we don't cry unto God, it's because we don't desire Him as we are. We've fallen in love with the false jewels of the world. We've fallen in love with the trinkets of this life, and we've been robbed of that precious time with God. I believe the psalmist cried unto Him because he desired to be with Him. You know, tonight, just because you're in this church building does not mean that God hears your cry. You know, just because you're in this church building tonight doesn't mean that you're one of God's children. Just because you're here tonight doesn't mean that heaven is your home. I'm afraid there are a lot of people that call unto God, but the problem is, is they've never known Him as Him being their heavenly Father and as them being a child. I remember going to the grocery store with my wife. Now, if my wife was here tonight, she could give a testimony to this. But when we go out, I really do not like going to the grocery store with my wife. Life is too short to stand in an aisle with a calculator to try to figure out, should I buy the 48-ounce ketchup or the 64-ounce ketchup? Listen, life is too short tonight to stand in line digging through a purse for coupons that are expired. I'm telling you, I just don't like going to the grocery store with my wife. But I remember one time I was in there and perhaps I was in the cereal aisle. I like being in the cereal aisle. And there was a little girl as she was inching back towards me. I noticed her out of the corner of my eye and she was making her way towards me and she was reaching backwards and finally she got right beside of me and she locked immediately on my pants leg. She pulled down at my pants leg, and I looked down at her, and she looked up at me, and her eyes got as big as silver dollars. That gal let go of me, and she took off like a shot down that aisle, and she was screaming, Daddy, Daddy, where are you? Little girl wandered away. She'd gotten so caught up with the items, she'd lost track of her dad. You know why that girl acted that way and why she ran from me rather than to me after the fact? I'll tell you why. Because I wasn't her father. She looked up at me and she came to the gross realization, this is not dad. And she wasn't about to treat a man as her father when he wasn't. Well, folks, do you understand that the same is true tonight of people that sometimes approach a God in heaven, but yet they have never humbled their heart and believed in the gospel and trusted Jesus Christ as their Savior? They may pray tonight and they may gain some sense of human comfort in that they are praying to God or so they think. But my friend, you can't have that cry of prayer until that relationship's been established. That's why the Bible says in Romans 8 and verse 14, For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. For ye have not received the spirit of bondage again unto fear, but ye have received the spirit of adoption. Here it is, whereby we cry, Abba, Father. I'm telling you, if you're here tonight, whether you were saved in the state of Florida or you were saved in New England or you were saved in a country abroad, listen, no matter your location, as a child of God, you can cry, Abba, Father, tonight. 
The Bible says in John 1 and verse 12, But as many as received Him, to them gave He power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on His name. My question tonight, are there people in this room, young or old alike, and you'd say, I don't have the cry of prayer evidenced in my life because I don't even know Him as my heavenly Father. Well, that's where it all begins. If you want to have powerful prayer, you better be born again. But you know, that cry of prayer is not only a sign of desire. That cry of prayer is also a sign of dependency. I cried unto Him with my mouth. The Bible tells us in Hebrews 4 and verse 16, Let us therefore come boldly unto the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Sometimes we think, boy, would the God of the universe, would the Creator, would He really take the time to hear us? Let me illustrate it for you this way. In my office at the college is the president's office. When you walk in the administrative building, the first thing you'll see when you look to the left is my secretary's office in my office. Now, sometimes I have students in my office, and when I call for them to come in my office, they come with fear and trembling. And usually it's not to wear them out, it's just to see how they're doing. Sometimes I'll just sit them down and I'll say, hey, tell me what's going on in your life. Hey, let's have a word of prayer. And on they go and they take a big sigh when they leave. It's sort of an intimidating place. But I'm going to tell you, there is one little girl that comes into my office. She doesn't think twice about it. My little daughter, Karis, she'll be eight years old at the end of this month. She has two older brothers. And while she is girly as girly can come, she can fight like a man when it comes to fending for herself for those two older brothers. But sometimes I can see that little head just bob right over that glass door and all of a sudden see the knob turn. And my daughter, without any hesitation, comes right into my secretary's office. And without saying very much to her, she comes right into my office. I can be meeting with preachers. I can be talking with students. And to her, it makes no difference. I can be in the steeped in the, in the most serious conversation and that little girl come walk in and just hop right behind my desk and jump right in my lap, put her arm around me and with that big smile say, Hey, Daddy, I just stop whatever I'm doing. If I'm talking to somebody, I say, You just have to wait just a second. I've got to see what's going on here. She comes in with no hesitation. She comes in with no fear. And she approaches her father and she says, Dad, how are you doing? And this is what I need. I've tried to learn a trick. She likes to go to the commons. She likes to buy chocolate. She's like most women. She likes chocolate. And you know what I purposely did is I stopped bringing cash to school. I'd say, Honey, I don't have any cash. And would you know that little girl now? She doesn't ask for cash. She says, Dad, do you have your debit card? But I'm telling you, if there's a little girl in North Carolina who knows what it means to be able to come boldly into her dad's office and to ask whatever, my question to you tonight, is this room filled with a group of people that knows what it means to come boldly into the throne of grace to find help in the time of need? Folks, I'm talking to some of you tonight. You know how you can tell you've been living your life independent from God? I'll tell you how. Because of your prayer life. There are things in your life that are very real needs tonight and you've failed to approach the throne of grace. The cry of prayer is a sign of dependency. Do you need Him tonight? Your prayer life will reveal that. But that cry of prayer is not only a sign of desire, it's not only a sign of dependency, it is also a sign of delight. At the end of verse 17, it says, I, it says, And he was extolled, or I cried unto him with my mouth. Here it is, And he was extolled with my tongue. That word extol is literally the idea of lift up. You know, when the psalmist called unto the Lord, I don't think it was just all about him. We come to God sometimes that way in prayer, don't we? Or we, we think it's all about ourselves. Lord, I need this. Lord, I need that. Lord, I need this. Lord, I need that. I need, I need, I need, I want. I want, I want, I need, I need, I want. And that basically sums up our prayer language. But can I tell you, that's not the only reason we pray. It's not just to talk about ourselves, but I believe that it's to talk about Him. And He was extolled. He was lifted up is the idea, it was the idea of praise. Psalm 34 and verse 1, I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. A preacher of yesteryear named Lester Roloff, many of you have heard of him. 
a very unique preacher. One time a lady came up to him after the service, and she said, Brother Roloff, you're a narrow-minded man. And he said, because that's I'm on a narrow way, man. He just had a way with bluntness sometimes. But you know, that man could put cookies on the shelf where we could all reach him. And one day Lester Roloff said this in a message. He said, don't you go to praising the Lord on Sunday if you can't praise Him on Monday when the clothesline falls in the mud. Now folks, that's where we live tonight. I will bless the Lord at all times. There's some of us. You know the reason we don't have powerful prayer? Because we've just been focusing on ourselves instead of lifting Him up. You want powerful prayer tonight? Then the cry of prayer better be evidenced in your life. Life, A cry in which you call unto God. You share your needs. You share your praises. Some of us don't have powerful prayer tonight because the cry of prayer is not even really true. Number two, you see the condition of prayer. And that's found in verse number 18. It says, If I regard iniquity in my heart, the Lord will not hear me. It's a condition. You know, as a kid growing up, my dad taught me what a condition was. This is usually how he taught me. He said, son, if you don't do this, then I'm going to do this. And that I'm going to do this part hurt. Son, if you don't take out the trash, then I understood what a condition was. I learned it from a very early age. I'm talking to some of you tonight. You know what a condition is. All of you hopefully do. God lays out a condition. He said, if I regard, that's what the psalmist says, if I regard iniquity in my heart. What does that word regard mean? The word regard means tonight to literally look at with favor. It's the idea of seeing something and on the inside thinking it's a good idea. A lot of times as human beings, we think about actions. Well, he did wrong. He did wrong. He did wrong. Let me tell you, God goes a step farther tonight. He not only sees when I do wrong, but he knows the very moment that foolishness lodges in my heart. We can look around and be the policeman for each other, and I can say, that person's out of sorts, that person's out of sorts. But before, nobody, before anybody else realizes something wrong, something's wrong in my heart, God knows it. My son Jared, I remember when he was a couple of years old, we lived in a little house, and we had a little glass candy dish that had uh, little glass pieces of candy on it. Uh, in it. Now, in our household, I don't know what you do, but I'm going to tell you what the Beals did. Uh, we didn't take everything that was breakable in our house and put it on the top shelf so the kids couldn't touch it. You know what we did? We left it right where it was at, and we taught our children a simple word, no. And let me tell you, that really gives you an ability to breathe when you're in other people's houses, and you don't put all their stuff on top of the shelf, and you tell your children no. And that's what we did. Now, it wasn't like our children obeyed all the time. But you know what? We taught them what the word no meant. And I'll never forget one day Jared stuck his hand in that glass candy dish. And he was just swirling that glass candy around. And I turned around and I looked at him and I said, son, no. He pulled his hand right out of there. And then I thought I would set up a little experiment. And so I turned my back to him, but I had my head cocked in such a fashion that I could just look out of the corner of my eye and I could see what he was doing. Now, he didn't know that I could see him, but I did. And I'll never forget what I saw. That little boy looked down at that glass candy dish and he looked up at me. He looked down at that glass candy dish and he looked up at me. And then he looked down at that glass candy dish and with the biggest smile you've ever seen in your life, he looked up at me. And then you know what he did. He did the very thing that I asked him not to do. Now, before you look down on my son, he just takes after his dad. He comes by it honestly. If I ask you tonight, I said, when did that boy make a mistake? When did that boy sin? Some of you simply, sim simply might say tonight, well, it's when he stuck his hand in the dish. I tell you tonight, it's when he regarded it in his heart. Do you know it's possible to come to a service tonight and look great on the outside and harbor bitterness in your heart towards your parents and therefore your prayers not heard? Do you know this evening it's easy for you to bend out, be bent out of shape about something or have some secret, so-called secret sin working in your life and you've allowed it and everybody else thinks you're okay. But God tonight knows what we regard in our hearts. 
If I regard iniquity in my heart, what does he say? The Lord will not hear me. And when the psalmist wrote that, he wrote it very emphatically. In other words, this is a condition. God's not going to just change His mind on this because you're a Sunday school teacher. You know, for us even as preachers, can I tell you tonight, preachers cannot live above the Bible. Any preacher that thinks he's invincible or that he's above the very Word of God that he preaches, it's a matter of time before God exposes him. But he said, he said if, any, if, if, if I regard iniquity in my heart, the Lord will not. That's very emphatic. You know, sometimes at the college we have what's called the Valentine's Banquet. You know, and I've seen sometimes girls ask, or girls be asked by guys to that banquet, and I've seen some pretty ruthless turndowns. I've seen guys go to a young lady, a guy will go to her and say, w would you go to the banquet with me? And she says, well, I appreciate the offer, but I, I just, no, I don't think so. Now, the guy walks away from that with a little hope that maybe she'll change her mind. You know, there's always next year, next month, next week, tomorrow in his mind. But you know, I have seen him go up to a girl before and say, would you go with me to the bank? And before she could even, he could even say the t on banquet, she looked at him and said, no. Nada. Yeah. And any other way she could tell him no. That's pretty emphatic. Now, is the psalmist saying tonight, if I sin, God will never hear my prayer again? No, this is what he's saying. He's saying, as long as I have it in here, God's not going to hear me and that's not going to change. There may be some of you tonight, you're wishing that God would change. I'm going to tell you, the only way you're going to have powerful prayers is if you change. You've got to get rid of your stubbornness tonight. You've got to get rid of your self-justification. You've got to get rid of the concealment. Pull off the mask and say, God, and this is where I'm at, and agree with Him and get rid of it. That's the condition of prayer tonight. But the last thing I want you to see very simply is the, uh, not only the condition of prayer, but I want you to see the confidence in prayer. Verse number 19, But verily God hath heard me. He hath attended to the voice of my prayer. Blessed be God which hath not turned away my prayer, nor is mercy from me. You know, there's some of you, you drive an old vehicle for years, and then you buy a new vehicle. You sit down in the driver's seat, you put the key in the ignition, and you turn the switch, and there's absolutely no worries. You think back to those days when you drove that vehicle, and you would pray and ask God seven times a day to turn that switch so it would crank. That's a wonderful feeling. You get a new vehicle, you put the key in there, and you turn it, and there's no worries whatsoever. That's what happens in verses 19 and 20. The psalmist, after praying, he says, But verily God hath heard me. Imagine with me if somebody came in the back of this church building tonight and they put their arm around you and they said, your loved one is dying in the hospital right now and we need you to pray right now. As they would say up in the mountains where I'm from, they'd say, are you on praying ground? You think this very moment, we could, pre we could talk a lot about theory, but why don't we talk about practical living for just a moment? If somebody came in and they said, we need you to pray right now. Listen, could you bow your head, close your eyes, pray to God and open your eyes and know that God has heard your prayer? Or listen, would you pray some words and offer some feeble comfort to somebody, but understand that you may be powerless because you're harboring things in your heart? Folks, what good is prayer if you can't have confidence in it? Sometimes we blow a lot of hot air and we say a lot of eloquent phrases and we, we accomplish absolutely nothing. We look at our nation today and we say, God, can you ever turn it? I'm going to tell you where it begins. It begins when in places like this, we're more concerned about powerful prayer than we are show. We are more concerned about hearing from God and God hearing from us than we are the pleasures of this world. You say, will God ever send revival? It will not come or even begin to come until we as God's people humble our hearts and confess our sin. Those things are the precursors to powerful prayer. 
You know where a lot of lies are told? Some of you men tonight, you say, I'll tell you where they're told. They're told in my barber shop. I can sit down there and that barber tells the same story four times. The fish gets longer and longer. There's some of you tonight, you say, I'll tell you, Brother Beal, I'll tell you where the lies are told. They're told in Washington, D.C. And you may be right. Let me correct that. You are right. <laughs> but would you mind if for, about, for a minute I turned the guns at us? You know where a lot of lies are sung? Places just like this. You know what, young people, when we sing, I surrender all, when the truth is we don't surrender anything or some. We sing, I love to tell the story of unseen things above when we've done well to tell anybody in weeks. But you know where I've had to hang my head on occasion when I've sat in a service just like you are tonight, when the song leader would come and say, let us sing, sweet hour of prayer, sweet hour of prayer. Because I realized that in my life it wasn't a matter of a sweet hour of prayer. It wasn't even a matter of sweet minutes of prayer because I had crowded God out of my life. And folks, I'm going to ask you this evening, why don't we just peel off the mask that we have put on for everybody else and lay ourselves open and bare before God and more than anything tonight before we leave this service, seek to have powerful prayer like Elijah of old. Let's bow our heads together. Our heads are bowed, our eyes are closed. I want to ask you just a few questions as we close this service tonight. And then we'll be done. Our heads are bowed, our eyes are closed.